Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have Marissa Levin, who is the founder of Information Experts in Successful Culture. She spent the last 20 years overcoming personal and business challenges while turning her company Information Experts into a multi-million dollar global communications and education firm. She's also the author of Built to Scale, which is a how-to on top companies creating exceptional advisory boards, which we will talk about, and a book, My Company Rocks, about how to create a culture of high engagement, which we also talk about. Her company has won over 70 national and international awards, and she was a finalist for Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2002. Marissa, thank you so much for joining me. It's great to be here. You know, I'm excited to hear your big lessons, mistakes, challenges in your journey. I know you probably don't like the word mistakes or failures, which we'll talk about why, what worked, what didn't work. Um, I want to—I always like to start with a fun fact so people get to know, you know, your quirky self. Um, <laughs> and two things about Marissa is she's really has an obsession and fascination with lizards. There's no particular reason. Um, and the other one is you have a bucket list of 30 items. What are some of those items? Okay, so I do have a bucket list of 30 items. So, um, you know, it's funny. Some people have bucket lists that have to do with um, acquiring material things. I'm definitely an experiential person. So several things in my bucket list are geographical. Um, I've not gone to Israel yet, so Hmm. I've got a few things on there. Um, I want to get to Australia and hold a sloth. I want to get to Australia and hold a koala bear. I want to go to China to the um, panda sanctuary and hold a panda bear. I want to be in front of the stage for an Elton John concert and a U2 concert. I want to see a Royal Shakespeare, uh, I want to see a play at the Royal Shakespeare Theater in London. Um, I'm going to climb Machu Picchu soon. I want to go on safari. So I've just got, I want to see the Northern Lights in Iceland. I want to um, tour the canals in a gondola in Venice. I want to go to the pyramids. And I really want to go to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and yell, Bobby, Cindy, just the way Jan did on the Brady Bunch. (laughs) Like that's, that's definitely on my bucket list to uh, hit the bottom of the Grand Canyon the way Jan did. That's that's a quirky fun fact too. So what is your process for achieving these things? Obviously you have a lot, and we'll talk about some of your companies. What is your process for, you have something on your bucket list. Well... So, I mean, where I am in my life today, I've got a um, son who's going into 11th grade. He'll be 17. I have a son who's going into 8th grade. He'll be 14. Right now, my priorities are getting my kids where they need to be and Mm -hmm. kind of getting them to the finish line of getting them into college. So my bucket list is tabled. It's on the back burner. Mm -hmm. But a time will come, and this is just my own parenting strategy, a time will come where my own personal needs will supersede their needs and will hand the baton to them and say, you're accountable for your own journey. You need to take ownership of that. And that's kind of our whole entire parenting philosophy of preparing them for that. Mm -hmm. And then it will be my turn. Mm -hmm. So I am, you know, I have this list going and I just have a lot of patience behind it and I will get to all of it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, so. Usually I'll ask, I like to ask about some of the inform, you know, the inspiration, big influences growing up. But what I mentioned at the top of the interview with the intro is overcoming personal and business challenges. What were some of those? I can't wait for the rest of it. I need to hear now. <laughs> what, what were some of those personal and business challenges you had overcome to create such a, you know, um, phenomenal company? Well, so they've all been integrated. I mean, I do not believe that one can compartmentalize work from life. In fact, I think that whole entire phrase, work-life balance or work-life integration, is really a misnomer because work is part of life and life is part of work. It really is how do you integrate rather than compartmentalize the pieces of your life. So especially as you're building a family while you're building a business, they're always going to be intertwined. They're always going to bleed over. Um, I am not a fan of the whole lean-in philosophy. In fact, I believe that while our companies need our help getting to the next level, our kids need help getting to the next level. Mm-hmm. And that probably should be the priority. So 
as I've built the company over 20 years, my husband is in the business with me. He's been in the business for 12 years. So, you know, we're very much of a team that way. Mm -hmm. um, I've always believed that we have sacrificed the growth of the business for the development of our children mm -hmm. at certain times. And that's just what we've had to do. Right. I, I believe that ultimately patience untangles everything and that you end up where you're supposed to be and on a growth trajectory when you're supposed to be at that time. I've, um, you know, we've had a lot of personal things in our family. I'm a melanoma survivor. Yesterday was my fifth year anniversary of being clean from um, any breast cancer tumors. Congratulations. So, thanks. So that was huge. And I know you mentioned in an email about you, you said I dodged cancer three times. I did. So I had, um, I, I had uh, pre-cervical, I have pre-cervical cancer. I had to get that taken care of when I was in my 20s. I've had melanoma and I had two cancerous tumors in my breast five years ago wow. that we got very early. It's really so scary. I so, well, I look, you know, I look at it, I'm very grateful. I've had access to great care. I, you know, was diagnosed early. I live an extremely healthy lifestyle. I don't drink at all. I exercise every day. You know, I meditate. So I live a very, very healthy lifestyle. And I know that that has um, partially, you know, why my body was able to recover the way it did. Mm -hmm. So what's the mindset when you hear news like that? How do you just forge ahead? Because, you know, some people show, everyone reacts differently to that type of news. What What was your mindset? I just had this conversation with someone yesterday because they, you know, I'm always hearing you're so strong, you're so strong. You know, Jeremy, I don't really see where I had a choice. Right. I mean, I, you know, I have two kids that are depending on me and I made a commitment to them when they were born, you know, I was going to show up and I was going to be strong and I was right. going to, you know, persevere. Like, I don't really understand what my, if I had a choice, right. you know, you get, you get dealt the cards that you're dealt. There isn't one person on the face right. of this planet that doesn't get dealt something that's not good. Right. And, you know, we can't control what is dealt to us, but we can control how we handle it. And right. I, I do have, you know, a very, very strong spiritual, um, practice and and um i think that you know my, my spirituality is a huge part of what my strategy is i believe that the obstacle is not a deviation from the path i believe that the obstacles in our life are the path and everything in our life whether it's good or bad is impermanent every single thing and so we're stronger than our obstacles and um it, it's just a matter of recognizing that anything that's going on in our life at that moment in time it's just a blip on our overall screen, like our whole radar screen, right? right? No matter what it is, if your business is failing, if your marriage is failing, if your kid's in trouble at school, like it doesn't matter how big it is mm -hmm. in the overall scheme of your life. If we're all here, you know, 70, 80 years, it's still one thing and it does not define who you are as a whole. Right. So that's kind of... Yeah, you know, some yeah. of my thought process. Yeah. So your mindset is, I will do whatever it takes to be here for my kids. And because that's... I'll get through it. There will be a light at the end of the tunnel. There will be something on the other side. What that will be, I don't know, but I will get through it. Right. And that's just, I, don't, I don't really see where I have a choice. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about growing up. What was an inspiration and big influence for you? Well, I am, I, um, you know... For most of my life, until the time I was 13, I had a really idyllic childhood. You know, I, I mean, I definitely had a phenomenal neighborhood with a million kids, you know, playing capture the flag, kick the can, running bases, chasing the ice cream man. Yeah, I, I just, you know, I had an idyllic childhood. Um, my family, the synagogue was a major central part of our life. So again, getting back to the spirituality. And I think just having certain communities um, Ted Leonsis talks about that in his book yeah. about happiness, that one of the key strategies to people really finding happiness is being part of multiple communities. So that's just something that I've always done. I've always mm -hmm. had a lot of different communities and circles around me. And it's something that in my coaching practice, when I work with CEOs and executives, that's something that we work on is intentionally getting them into different communities, mm -hmm. not only for business, but just for overall wellness and, and health and feeling connected. So I think... You know, I don't know if I necessarily had heroes growing up, but I was definitely parts of major, major communities. And I think that that had a lot to do with establishing how I felt about myself as a person. So what happened after 13? You said it was ideal till 13. My parents got divorced. Oh. I mean, 
know, it's the same entire, it's the same story as like more than 50% of the people in the population. So, you know, and again, it was just part of my journey and there was a lot of, you know, struggle there and resilience there and uh, just adapting and rolling with the punches and yeah. it is what it is. That forms you though. I mean, that's part of that forms your character, right? Of course it does. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, it, you know, it didn't really affect my stability overall. I never doubted, you know, who I was or where I was or whether or not I was loved or any of that kind of stuff. It just, that was the journey. Mm-hmm. So, and it, and it all, um, it all provided its own benefits and, um, and rewards in different ways that never would have happened if my parents wouldn't have gotten divorced. So mm-hmm. that's just the journey. Yeah. So what did the early days of your career look like then? So my undergraduate degree was actually in English with a concentration in Shakespeare. So I've always been a communicator from yeah. the time I could hold a pen. I was writing. And uh, and I covered um, Capitol Hill, actually, as a journalist when I graduated undergrad. And that really got me into the field of telecommunications. And then I was recruited away from a telecommunications consulting firm. I got into consulting. I put myself through a master's degree in instructional design and human resources development and organizational development. Um, Was working for someone who capped my worth at $34,000. Why? What did they say to you? They said, you'll never be worth more than $34,000 to the company. Why did they say that? You know what? I had quantified my worth. I had actually done a business case on what I was worth in terms of my um, degree, how much money I was making the company, my gender, my um, mm-hmm. my experience, and my boss didn't see any more value than that. So one of the lessons I learned growing up was you don't let other people determine your worth. Mm-hmm. And so uh, my husband and I decided, let's start our own company. And I, I started it from a place, and that's information experts, I started it from a place of knowing what I didn't want rather than what I knew what I want. I didn't have a business plan. We went to an Italian restaurant that had paper tablecloths. I literally, you know, mapped out like what I was good at, who I wanted to serve and what my customer base, yeah. customer base was going to look like and what services I was going to provide and how I was going to find them. And that was my first business plot, my first business plan on a paper tablecloth. And then I incorporated that weekend and that's how the information experts was formed. So what was on that tablecloth at the time? It was the um, associations, telecommunications companies, nonprofits. Those were the companies. I, those were the industries I was serving. Mm-hmm. I was going to be providing online help systems and designing and developing training programs. And I was going to market through networking because there really wasn't an internet then. This was before the internet. Right. There weren't. There weren't. There wasn't LinkedIn and Facebook and you know, listserv was actually. It's hard to. It's hard to grasp that even that that those things didn't exist. No, I mean, you actually had to pick up the phone and go to places. You know, I mean, if you had a fax machine, you were like really, really cutting edge. <laughs> what were your strengths that you put down at the time? Uh, you know what? Definitely connecting with people and um, taking initiative and just not really being intimidated and going out there. And that, that's really what it was, connecting and communicating. It's the mm-hmm. same exact um, strengths now that allow me to be successful. They haven't changed. So what did the early days then of information experts look like? I, you know, it's interesting. I was definitely much more of a reactive type of vendor where I would go in instead of, and now I specialize in strategic planning, visioning, things of that nature. But, you know, back then I was in my early 20s. I mean, you know, I I was so young and inexperienced. And what I really focused on was reacting to what a client needed. And I would basically give them a proposal based on price. It really wasn't based on value. Mm-hmm. It was based on price. And then as you grow, you learn that you really need to shift to value and get away from price if you're really going to you know, grow significantly in the marketplace. And so I basically you know, got an MBA on the job the first 10 years. What made you decide to start on your own? Because some people may have you know, walked and talked to their boss and said, you're worth 34000 Okay, bye. I'll go to another company. But you just started to, to strike out on your own. I fell in love with the field of adult learning and consulting through my through my job and through my master's degree program, and I I loved it. And I just decided, you know what? If I'm going to work 16 hours a day, right. I'm going to do it for someone that appreciates it, and that would be myself. Mm-hmm. So I just I tried it. It was before we had kids. You know, very low risk. Didn't really know what I was getting into. Biting off more than I can chew. 
And uh, I just tried it. I mean, it was just something that I just tried. I figured if it didn't work, I could always go and get a job. So how did it work? Tell me about the first couple clients that you bring on. So the first couple clients were associations, and I was doing all of their training materials and online help systems. And my first contract was three months, and it was $35,000. It's pretty good. So, so it was four times the amount, really, I was making because my salary was capped at 34 for the year, and I was getting paid 35 for a quarter. Right. So that kind of, I was like, wow, okay, I don't think I'm going back to work for anybody ever again. You know, I mean, here I am, and I'm sitting in my office at home. I don't have to go and report into anybody. So I think it takes it takes a lot of self-discipline. It takes confidence. And, um, you know, it takes tenacity and resilience. And you have to find a way to uh, really contain the fear. Like, that's the other thing about starting a business. The fear can be paralyzing. And even, even not just starting a business, but I think all businesses have to always think of themselves in growth mode and survival mode. Always, because as soon as you get complacent, complacent, someone is right behind you, ready to take your spot, and they're working harder than you. Mm-hmm. When you get complacent, someone is working harder than you, and you've just put your clients in jeopardy. So how do you grow beyond the first couple of clients? So you hire um, or you outsource. I mean, back then, it really was that you hired, um, you know, maybe part-time people. Now... The business model is, I mean, you can outsource to anything, anybody for anything. So I've got a whole team now of virtual assistants who do things. And I think, you know, to figure out what you want to outsource, if you think of a quadrant, right, you always want to focus on what you love and what you're good at. That's really what you want to focus on. Anything else that's in any of the other quadrants, like don't love, not good at, you know, any. You really need to outsource that. And then there's also about the value. I mean, I'm coaching a client now, and she wants to bring in an assistant. And she's like, well, I really didn't want to pay $20 an hour. We negotiated. You know, we got her down to where she was comfortable. But I said, you're worth more than $20 an hour. You know, you're a leader. You need to be out there doing strategic activities. You can't be doing all the administrative data entry. That's not a good use of your time. There's an opportunity cost there. So, Knowing what you're worth and then knowing what you can outsource that is more, you know, mechanical or, or administrative, that that leaders and CEOs should not be doing that type of work. So yeah. figure out what you need from an infrastructure standpoint and outsource it. So for information experts, I know you mentioned there's a lot of pivot points that you made within yeah. the company. Tell yeah. me, how do you recognize, because some people may just stay stagnant and, and keep on that, whatever they're doing. What were some of those pivot points and how did you change and know to change? So here's the thing about um, vision, right? So you need to be able to, there's two, there's really two prongs of vision. There's looking straight ahead and over the horizon to kind of understand of what's coming at you, right? Like what's about to hit you. Right. And that means you have to read a lot. You have to stay, you have to keep your finger on the pulse of your industry. You have to keep your finger on the pulse of our, of our congressional agenda. I mean, you know, what, what, how, what is driving our society um, decisions. And then there's a vision of you looking out with the ideas of where you want to take the company. So where do you want to go as well as what's coming towards you? It's two sides. of It's two prongs of vision. And when it comes to pivoting, you really have to know what's coming towards you. And, and when you learn what's coming towards you, you have to assess what's happening inside your company. And no matter how much you love what you're doing, if it's not aligned with where the market is going, mm-hmm. you're going to go out of business. Mm-hmm. And then you have to be prepared to make really hard decisions. And that is one of the hardest lessons learned that any entrepreneur makes because some of those hard decisions are firing people and laying yeah. people off and restructuring and and getting rid of clients, you know, existing clients in, 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 to make room for other clients. It's letting go of, um, you know, one of my favorite coaches is Marshall Goldsmith. And he wrote, sure. what got you here won't get you there. Yeah. Right? That's a really, really important lesson for entrepreneurs to know that they're going to have to let go of people that got them to a certain level in yeah. order to get to the next level. And it's painful. Yeah. So what was one of those, the hardest decisions you had to make? Um, letting go of a lot of people recently. I mean, when I say recently, I'm saying like three or three years ago, 
when the government, you know, we do a lot of work with the government, and they instituted what's known as the lowest price technically acceptable mandate. It's called LPTA. Okay. So we have contracts that have been in place for a long time. And when the government awarded us those contracts, those labor categories allowed us to pay a certain rate. Okay. For argument's sake, not that these are accurate, but for argument's sake, let's say that we were awarded a contract where several of our resources, we are able to pay them $100 an hour. All right. So that means that we have these salaried employees that when you average it all out, say they were making 80 grand an hour, 80 grand a year, and we were able to pay them $100 an hour. I'm just, that's just for argument. Those for numbers sure. are not accurate. Then the government, your biggest client, comes back to you and they say, we're instituting an LPTA a lowest price technically acceptable mandate, those $100 an hour rates that we had awarded you and approved, they're now $50 an hour. But we expect you to have the same, the same work. level of quality yeah, right. and the same level of experience. So now I can't afford the people that have been with me that are making $80,000 a year right. because I can only pay $40,000 a year right. unless, I'm, unless I want to go out of business. Right. They'll make twice so, of what the contract is worth if you did that. So yeah. those are those are hard pivots yeah. that we had to make. Um, you know, going all the way back to 15 years in business, John Chambers, the CEO of Cisco, announced that e-learning would be the killer internet application, and literally overnight, the whole e-learning industry shifted. And I had to pivot. I had to not be an instructional instructor-led training organization. I had to be a multimedia training organization and I had to hire and grow an entire multimedia team because instructional designers back then didn't do programming. They mm -hmm. were separate. So it's just being aware and not putting your head in the sand and saying pivot or die. That's what you have to do. Yeah. And you have to get a whole new set of clients. <sighs> yeah. So how do you do that? How do you break into almost, it's almost like a new industry. Well, you know, it's interesting because, um, there was just an article in Forbes about adjacent businesses mm -hmm. and how it's a huge trend now where businesses that have been around for a long time, they are now launching adjacent businesses. So I launched Successful Culture two years ago, mm -hmm. and it's all about strategy, executive coaching, CEO to CEO coaching, facilitation, retreats. Information Experts has a human capital practice. Mm -hmm. The companies are not so far off. And what's happened now that Successful Culture is growing is they are actually starting to feed on one another, where I'm bringing leads and clients from Successful Culture into information experts. Now, that wasn't my intention, but I see that there is, you know, there's some synergy. So we'll see how that works out. But again, it gets back to the pivot. And in the government space, these companies that have put all of their eggs in the basket of federal contracting have had to learn how to bring that to either the state and local market or bring it to the commercial market or the nonprofit market. Um, also, uh, moving from services to products slash services. I mean, lots of shifts, lots of shifts, how you bring down overhead, a lot of stuff changing. So with information experts, I, I want to get into successful culture too, but sure. with information experts, you know, um, what's some of the, the clients you had that uh, are most memorable to you? And like what you had to do for them. So, you know, the thing about information experts is it really is very gratifying to be serving our government. I mean, you know, we work with a dozen different federal agencies and to be able to support the missions. Now, the government gets a really bad rap in the, in the press, but there are some really great people working in the government. And we have had the um, privilege of doing things like designing and developing training. You know, we're a prime on one of the Army's largest training and education contracts. So we have the privilege of designing and developing training and education for hmm. our warfighters. So what does that so, look like? So what that looks like is we have a whole team of instructional designers down in Jacksonville, and hmm. we have program managers, and our warfighters need education and training in hmm. order to stay safe on the battlefields. So we are just one contractor of a large community that is cranking out training that our soldiers take on a regular basis to hmm. stay safe. And so it doesn't matter if you're pro-war or anti-war, we're all in favor of our soldiers staying safe. Right, for sure. So to, to be able to be a part of that and be able to keep them safe through education and training is extremely rewarding. Um, yeah. Another client is Environmental Protection Agency. And so 
we have created training on radiation risk um, awareness to educate the general public. We have created training for the K-12 population on how to be sun smart. It's called SunWise. Um, we have created education and training for the uh, FDIC called Money Smart, and that is a whole curriculum on financial literacy so that we're training and educating the young adults yeah. on how to be financially literate, making sure that they're not getting themselves into trouble. One of our clients right now is Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, and we're doing a lot of financial literacy awareness for them. So the work that we do for our government is extremely rewarding. Yeah. Let's say, Marissa, people are doing internal education training for their company. What are some essential things they need to include in how you put together an education and training? So first and foremost is stakeholder communication and stakeholder assessment. Never assume that you know what your audience wants mm -hmm. or what they need. Um, make sure that you create a mechanism, and I do this with my clients through Successful Culture with, with a feedback assessment. Um, create and you know, construct an assessment that allows you to create, to collect data about what the needs of the learners are. And um, if you are doing it in an organization and you want to create a safe environment, then you do it so that it's anonymous, so that they feel safe, right. comfortable providing information and creating like a two-way feedback mechanism to collect that data. So that would be the first thing. The second thing is to recognize that um, and you know, this is something that as an, as an educational technology firm that we are very much aware of is, you know, be, um, between now and, and 2017, literally billions of smartphones are going to be sold. And for many people, that's going to be literally their only computer. Yeah. Like they're not going they're to mini have computers. Desktop. Yeah. They're literally going to be using this for all of their learning. So if you are designing and developing any type of education program, online education, be aware of the devices that will be in play to access that yeah. and make sure you're designing and developing yeah. it um, to be maximized on those yeah. devices. So you're saying if you're not mobile friend friendly, you'll die. No. It will die. Just, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you definitely have to design. You know, it's like what Wayne Gretzky said, you skate to where the puck is going, not to where it been right so that's one of the places where education and training is going is definitely you know mobile i think the assessment piece is really interesting you know really you know finding out what the the needs are what has been the most surprising result you've seen or maybe a ceo was surprised because of what came back in the feedback you know i think um the most well i've done it enough that i'm not really surprised by anything anymore right but especially the fact that we have four generations, almost five generations now working side by side in the, in the workplace, mm -hmm. you really have to be cognizant of how people process information, how they access information, how they store information. There are a lot of privacy differences between the older generations and the younger generations. The older generations are not comfortable with the social media aspect. Um, the younger generations are very comfortable with gamification, where you're using different strategies to engage your learners. The older generations are not. So you have to be very sensitive to the demographics of your audience when you're designing. What did the leader, like in that instance, what did the leader has to change once they hear that type of information? Is there anything they can do at the time? You know, well, I mean, it depends on who your leader is, right? I mean, the best leaders are the most adaptable leaders. The best leaders are the ones who are most connected to their constituency. So it depends if you are um, an externally connected leader or if you just literally have your head down and you're focused just on your single agenda. It really it, it depends on the leader. Mm -hmm. So tell me about what's a – from – I want to get on to talk about successful culture. What's sure. the big lesson you learned – from information experts, and then let's. Uh, I want to talk about why and how you formed successful culture. So I formed successful culture uh, two and a half years ago because my my passion is connecting with other CEOs and executives. Like I just I get electrified and charged up, and yeah. that's. What I watched. Do you think you gave a TED talk to a group of women about board talks, and I, I just did. saw you just. Were electrified. I mean, that's the only word I could think of. You, you were uh, passionate, very passionate. Yeah, I gave the TED talk on how why women taking their place in the boardroom, why the time is now. Yes. So that's what my passion is, and 
Information Experts, you know, is, is a 20-year-old firm. It's very process-oriented. We've done everything right in terms of that regard, that it's process-oriented, it's structured. Right. I can't go rogue in my own company, you know, like I, but here's the thing, and this has to do with, you know, most founders of companies only last seven years in the role of CEO. And the reason for that is because the idea of starting and building a company is very, very different than maintaining a company, okay? And my passion as an entrepreneur is to build and to connect. And so I couldn't go rogue in my own company, and I just needed, as a communicator, to be able to have some platform or some mechanism to connect with other leaders. Mm -hmm. And that's why I started Successful Culture. I, I really didn't have this vision to grow it into what it's grown. Now, now I have a very, very formal business plan and a very clear vision on where I'm taking it and I'm executing against that. But my, my um, initial, you know, idea of starting it was just so that I had a platform for my own voice to connect mm -hmm. with my other, um, you know, entrepreneurial leaders in the community. So what kind of, I mean, you had to put some really major systems in place so you could actually, you know, do what you want with a successful culture. What were some of those key systems you had to put in so you could spend some time doing, um, you know, working on successful culture? Uh, so first and foremost, it's the people. So my executive team and information experts is phenomenal. And they've been with me for a long time. I mean, I've got, you know, I've got a director there. A VP who she's been with me for um, fourteen years, I think. Wow! You know, I've got I've got people who've been with there 10, 12, 14, 15 years. Their chemistry with each other and their trust it got to the point, Jeremy, where I was actually in the way of their progress because they're the ones who are really moving the company forward on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. And you know, we talk at least I talk a lot about the Peter principle where employees rise to the highest level of their incompetence in the organization. They just really can't go any higher. And so at that point you have to see if there's somewhere else you can put them or you coach them out. And a lot of people don't talk about the Peter principle applying to the C-suite mm -hmm. because a lot of C-level execs don't want to admit that that might be happening. <laughs> That's a I big like, ego, a strike to the ego. If, if well, you know, and if you lead from a place of ego, then it's an issue. I've never, I've never lived my life from a place of ego. It just, you know, it just is, that's just not who I am. And I was more than willing to say, I think the company will be more effective and more successful if I step aside and I am able to guide them, you know, from the sidelines peripherally from a visionary standpoint. Mm -hmm. But I really was in the way of the executive team. And they execute much more effectively without me involved in the day to day. There's no doubt. How do people realize that? Because I think, you know, you're in your own bubble. You know, some people they may be kind of capped, and maybe they don't know it, right? How do you even? I mean, you're pretty self aware, so you may know I'm in their way with this, but some people may not be. How do you know that? Okay, this is I need to, to bring in other help, or I need to to do something else. When it's not fun anymore. Yeah. And then it kind of, I guess, goes into the your My Company Rocks book, right? Mm -hmm. So what's one of your favorite stories from from My Company Rocks, which is, you know, building a great culture? So, you know, I wanted to really hold on to an entrepreneurial culture. And when things really started going downhill with the government and the way they shifted, my culture had to shift in response to what my customer was demanding. It didn't fit me as a person. Mm. It just didn't. I mean, I... The government wants lowest price, right? I'm not a lowest price person. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I'm all about value. And so I went through this identity crisis, really, a couple years ago with who am I? And I didn't, I didn't believe in the value proposition, the value system of my customer because they wanted lowest price. Right. I think it's going to swing back. I mean, I think the government actually is starting to realize that you want a lowest price, you got it. That's and what you'll get. Guess what you get for lowest price? Yeah. You get incompetence, right? Mm -hmm. You get people who are not engaged. So I think the pendulum is going to probably swing back to center, um, and, it, and it will all come back. Like I always say, patience untangles everything. But it was, you know, it's a terrible feeling to wake up and not wanting to go to your own office because 
your customers destroying what you've built. Mm -hmm. so. So, so then what do you do at that time? I mean, you have to just pivot again? Yeah, you pivot again and you recognize, um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, when I put people in to place, we used something in information experts called the EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. And it's basically a framework and it's a whole system of tools that you use to build an, uh, an infrastructure. And one of those tools is called the GWC. It's the right people, right seat. Do they get it? Do they want it? And do they have the capacity to do it? So do they really get what you need them to do? Do they want it with a burning desire more than anything else? And do they have the capacity, whether it's physical capacity, intellectual capacity, emotional, time capacity, mental capacity? If I looked at myself really, really honestly, right, with no filters, no rose-colored glasses, and I looked at what leadership was required to get information experts through this whole lowest price, technically acceptable disaster of a situation, and I compared that to who I was as a person and what my capacity as a leader was, I was not the right person. I got it. I knew exactly what was needed. Mm -hmm. I did not want it. I did not want to lead a company through, through the lowest price technically acceptable. I did not want to become a lowest price company. That's right. not why I started this 20 years ago. Right. And I really didn't have the emotional capacity to deal with the whole LPTA environment. So I have a great executive team behind me. And they you know, were able and willing to step up. And my value, greatest value to the company, was being outside the company, being a brand evangelist. That really was where my value was. So it, it, it um, does take a tremendous amount of introspection and self-awareness yeah. in order to say, this isn't, I'm, this isn't working because I'm not the best person for this company anymore. Right. So tell me about successful culture. When you started, you said it was more of a formal process. Tell me about the it was, start. It was a platform. It was really a communications platform where I can reach into my 20 years of experience how I've grown, how I've shifted, how I've screwed up, you know, all of that. And it was a place where I could share that with other entrepreneurs. And so that's kind of how it started. But I've always been involved in mentoring. And I just really wanted to formalize that and develop a full coaching practice. And, you know, so many coaches out there have never even built a business. They're a leader of one. And it's very, very different to be a leader of one than it is to be a leader of many. Yeah. So... I am, um, and I'm very process and strategically focused. So the companies that I work with, I'm implementing, I'm doing all their process architecture, implementing their processes, helping them identify current state versus desired state and what's needed in the middle to bridge that gap and putting in a whole framework in place that I have tools to keep them highly, highly accountable to move them forward towards the goals that we identify. So every engagement is tailored to an application that they fill out that I send them for, as a pre-qualification process. And I'm all about moving them forward. Are there any common systems that are missing that you find that people need to bridge that gap? Or is it just all different across the board? It, it, a lot of it depends on the industry. Like, obviously, if you're an internet, you know, online commerce, um, retail, like business to consumer type of company versus if you're, you know, a government contractor, they're going to be very different. I mean, I've got a client in, in Australia, clients all over the world. And one of my clients in Australia, she um, sells a huge assortment of different um, child development tools. So obviously the systems that we've been putting in place for her vastly differ from the systems that I'm working with a government contractor to mm -hmm. put his proposal process in place, his go, no go contract decision in place, um, his business development process in place, his HR, because he's brick and mortar. He's got employees, right? right? Whereas this person, the other client uh, is, you know, an online retailer. So mm -hmm. she doesn't have any employees. So the systems absolutely differ, mm -hmm. but you can break all of them into basically people, process and technology, mm -hmm. right? And then products and services. So everything's going to fall into different buckets, like those four buckets. The people that my retailer client needs, my online retailer that she needs around her are going to be completely different than the people that my government contractor client needs. Mm -hmm. So, and then I have a partnership. Um, I have a clientele, I have two realtors 
who are building a client, uh, who are building a partnership. And I'm coaching both of them separately, but also independently as they build their partnership. So it, every client has different requirements, but right. they really yeah. all fall into people, process, technology, yeah. and, and solutions. Yeah. For the online retailer, what were some of the, what do you see mistakes people make for the process part of things? Well, so we were looking at the different tools she had, like, you know, initially um, um, she had WordPress, okay, and we switched her content management system, we switched her to Infusionsoft, but then the way she managed the Infusionsoft process, that was something that was instrumental that I worked on her with, like, making sure that she managed that vendor appropriately yeah. so that she wasn't taken to the cleaners with the number of hours for consulting. So just looking at all of the different tools she had, one of the things that I've been really helpful with her is teaching her how to manage vendors, right? So rec helping her recognize that these vendors work for her. And uh, she's she's got to be responsible for containing them. So just giving her that type of structure and confidence in order to manage her vendors, things mm -hmm. like that. So with Successful Culture 2, I think I read somewhere, I think it was for that, It's a you're almost a catalyst for CEOs? I am. I'm a catalyst. And what I tell people is I'm not a therapist. I'm a catalyst. <laughs> Do they think you're a therapist? I've had, I've had I've declined clients uh, because they're not interested in being held accountable. Mm -hmm. Okay? They want to talk to me. And I've been asked to do hourly, not interested in hourly. I'm interested in transformation. So that means current state, desired state, what's in the middle, mm -hmm. and moving through that. I'm not interested in helping people feel better about themselves and getting mm -hmm. them over the hurdles. That's for a therapist. That's for maybe, you know, a, a CEO group or something like that. Mm -hmm. I can I talk them through their major problems without a doubt, and I can sympathize, and I can empathize, and I can commiserate, and I provide that emotional support, but it's within a framework of moving them forward, right. and I strategize with them on very specific things. So if you've got a difficult client and you don't know how to engage with them to get past an obstacle, we will literally structure the email conversations. We will, I will instruct them and guide them and say, after you have a conversation with a client, you need to hang up and you need to type an email documenting everything that was just said and you need to send them a conversation recap. And things that seem intuitive to some are not intuitive to others. Mm -hmm. So my job is to coach them to make sure that they are covering themselves and minimizing all of their liability and risk as they move forward. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you're about results, essentially. I'm all about results. So, I am a catalyst, not a therapist. So, I want to go to um, Built to Scale and yeah. about forming a board. Yeah. And how did you attract your board of exceptional advisors? And I want you to tell me a little bit about the book, too. So... I, the first board that information experts put in, I guess, was, I don't know if it was four years ago or maybe five years ago. It, it all blurs together. But I was sitting with a mentor one morning, and my company had just hit this wall where the morale was, you know, was um, in in a in flux. And I felt like it was a CYA mentality, a cover your ass mentality. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how to shift it. And I felt like we had you know, 70 projects going at one time and it was just the wild, wild west and there wasn't a lot of structure. And so my mentor said to me, you need an advisory board. And I was like, well, what's an advisory board? And he explained it to me. I went out and I did research on how you do it. There was nothing out there on mm -hmm. how to do it. So I fumbled my way through the process about how you select, how do you compensate, how do you bring them into the organization, associate them in, how do you use them? I fumbled my way through it and I documented it as I went along. Made a lot of because you're an information expert, so I'm information yeah. expert. Right. So I, you know, I I documented it, and then I was asked to speak to EO Entrepreneurs Organization, which I'm a member of, and I presented on it, and I created the scale model, and I basically took three and a half months, two years ago, and I and I wrote a book about it, and I created all of the templates that and it, that any EO any CEO needs, any entrepreneur needs to build a board, and so the whole entire back of the book are all of the templates and whoever buys the book, if they reach out to me, 
I'll send them all the Word documents for free because it just empowers them to help figure out what they need. And I'm all right. about moving the world forward one entrepreneur at a time. So, so tell me about I'm some about. of the the um, people you chose and why and or how you got them to, to actually come on your board. So, um, so the people that I chose for information experts, um, you know, we're very focused on the government. And as a government contractor, I needed access to decision makers that I otherwise was never going to get through those doors. Yeah. Now, those introductions are tremendously valuable. Obviously, the contractor has to um, submit the proposal. They have to follow the, the procurement and the acquisition process. They have to deliver. But getting in front of those decision makers is really hard. Yeah. And so there's a lot of retired government executives that are out there, especially all over D.C., and so I had met them in the course of my career of being out there, you know, whether it's through my writing or just being out there in the, in the community. And so several of them were, were ex-Gubbies, and um, I brought them on based on different agencies that we were in. One of my advisors, I wanted to put in a project management office, a PMO, and there was a woman who had a company that that's all she did was project management. And I went to her, and I and, you know, she took a liking to me. And um, I asked her to come on my board, and, and she gave me everything we needed to implement a PML, everything. And that was huge. So I rolled her onto the board for that. Then she sold her company, took a trip around the world, and I rolled her off the board. So, you know, it, the board is a very fluid and dynamic entity, and there are certain ways to set it up. You want it to be performance-based. You want it to really reflect where your organization is going, not just where it is now. And when you select the people on your board, your advisory board, you want to make sure that you have a clear understanding that how they will be engaged in your company. So are they only helping the CEO? Are they only helping the executive team? Are they working on business development? How engaged are they in your company? And all of that needs to be clearly defined up front in the board documents, which are in the appendix in the book. Yeah. I mean, when you just said that, I wouldn't have even thought it's that fluid. I would think, okay, you have this board advisor. And they're an advisor of the company and they stay on, but it, it changes a lot. It should change. Yeah. yeah. If your business changes and your business is growing, then hopefully you will be able to find additional advisors that will get you there. Yeah. So what's it, I mean, you have to name names. What's an example of how you attract someone? What do you offer them to come on? Well, people, um, people definitely, um, definitely when they serve on advisory boards, they are doing it um, not to not to pad their pockets, right? They're doing it because they want to give back to the community. They believe in the leader. They believe in the concept of the company. And, um, and they usually have time because these are people who have a lot of experience, right? right? So they're probably at a point in their career where they have extra time that they're able to give. Right. So those are the people that initially, you know, you attract. What you offer them, and this is actually in the compensation section of the book, there's really three ways that you can compensate. There's monetary where you're going to give them something little, you know, up front, like when you do your advisory meetings, you want to pay them some cash. Um, you, you want to do some equity. Typically, it's one half to one quarter, one percent um, for each advisor each year, and it's performance based tied into, you know, with a restricted stock agreement. And then there's other things like for the startups who are, who are really cash strapped, you can come up with creative ways. Like if you're a marketing firm, you can do their marketing for them. Um, if they serve on a board, maybe they want you to serve on that board or they want you to serve on the board of another company. So it's all about transparency and mm -hmm. communication and being really authentic about where you are in your business and what you're offering and what you need. It's all about transparent and authentic communication. And if you start there, you'll find the right people. Yeah. Yeah. So Marissa, what's been uh, a painful moment in business or a low point? Um, having to let go of people that we loved, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because contracts didn't come in. Um, taking large gambles on contracts and then again in the government space having them protested which means that we've invested lots and lots of money into winning something only to have it protested by you know by the by another vendor in the government and then it just sits there for a year mm. or a year and a half and we're out hundreds of thousands of dollars because we've invested to win it and then all of a sudden it's either canceled or it's protested. I mean, those are the things that put companies out of business. Right. So uh, 
a lot of it does have to do around the government contracting industry. Yeah. What about with anything with successful culture? You know what? I've been running the company now for two years. Um, the, you know, the first year I really wasn't, it really wasn't like my full-time focus. This year it's completely my full-time focus and I've had no pain points except mm-hmm. for that I'm too busy. You know, like I have, I have, a, I have a huge pipeline of, of companies and uh, CEOs that want to work with me. Um, and I'm working on really, really great projects. My only pain point is that I need a little bit more of support and I have such a vision for the company. I mean, I know where I want to take it. Mm -hmm. And so it's that, um, you know, it's that, it's that um, energy of wanting to get there faster and just knowing that it will all work out in time. But I, I don't have any, you know, pain points from successful culture at this point. What's the hardest part about what you do at successful culture? Um, you know, I just, I want to help as many people as possible and I don't know how to clone myself. (laughs) I think that's probably it. You know, like I can't, what, what makes me unique is the fact that I have 20 years of business experience, right? So I can't even delegate anything to another coach unless they have also run a business for 20 years. Mm -hmm. I can't just delegate it to somebody else. So I am putting in a system. I've created the transform you growth system. Mm -hmm. And eventually I do want to get to a franchising model, but even then the CEOs that work with me, very personal, they're going to have to have major business experience where they can talk about their own lessons learned. I can't just bring in a coach that is, certified or a coach that's been a coach for 20 years not that they're not capable or qualified but my whole thing is that i've already done it i've built a business right so that's what i need who's whoever's going to support me right so that's probably the biggest pain point yeah and you mentioned patience i think that's a tough thing because a lot of people see where they want to go and they're not there yet what do you do to to maintain that Um, so that's just something that I think you learn with age and with time. Um, and I just have a mantra, patience untangles everything. Mm -hmm. It's just something I made up on my own and it just seems that way. You know, I mean, ultimately everything works out exactly the way it's supposed to. So from the, Marissa, some of the painful moments, what's been a proud moment, something that you were amazed that you were able to accomplish? Uh, so in information experts, um, I guess it was like, let me think, my son was in kindergarten when we got the word. So almost nine years ago, we got notice that we won a contract, a government-wide contract called OPM, TMA. It's this training management and assistance contract. Huge vehicle. I had been watching it, actually, for seven years before that. Wow. Seven years. So Talk about company, patience. My company is 20 years old. So when I launched it, you know, the first three years were really just me at home, you know, doing contract work, right? Like small, small gigs. And then I was, then I put my eye on the government and there was a a vehicle there called OPM TNA. And it was just the, it was like the granddaddy of training contracts. And I knew to be on it, you had to have an infrastructure, you had to have past performance, you had to have people. I was just me. I didn't have any of that. And it came up every five years. So what I did, and this is, I mean, we're looking, we're going back 15 years now. Right. Okay. What I did was I aligned myself with the vendors that were on that contract, and I became a subcontractor to the companies that were on that, knowing that they didn't see my potential that they underestimated me, right? That they didn't see where I was going to take this company. I'm, I'm often underestimated. I really, I'm very, very often underestimated in my life. It's definitely a recurring theme. So I became a government contractor, subcontractor to these companies. And I watched them. And I was on probably five or six different teams. And I watched and I absorbed And I learned about what they did and who they did it for and how they operated and what their rates were. And I was just, I was basically spying preparing my my future competitors. And they didn't think anything of it because I was just an independent subcontractor. So the 
time came and went when it came out, and I knew that I was not in any place to bid it. But what I was able to do was I was able to spend the next five years developing relationships with everybody down in that office in that government agency. I had opened up those doors, and I met all the project managers, and I met the program manager who ran it, and I met the chief who ran it, and I FOIA'd, I, through the Freedom of Information Act, I FOIA'd the previous RFPs, the request for proposal, and I just absorbed. Hmm. And I knew that when it came up the next five years, that we were going to go for it. It was just, it wasn't an option. And I put the team in place. And it, months before the contract came out, and the day it came out, we were so ready. And uh, that, and this was, you know, before we were like, we probably were like a two million dollar company then. We were small. It cost us three hundred thousand dollars to win that contract. Wow. Three hundred thousand dollars to put the people on there to build the infrastructure. We had to submit twenty two past performances. I mean, it was huge. And. Um, the day we got that contract, I remember I was volunteering in my son's kindergarten class, and I got the email that we were awarded the contract, and I just remember thinking, I have no furniture in my house because I spent all my money and my salary on winning this contract, but I had this contract, <laughs> and it paid off. Like, I mean, but there's a, that's patience untangles everything. I mean, right. I tracked that contract. For almost 10 years before I won it. So what do you do to celebrate after that happens? I don't even remember. Do you buy a couch? I, I, uh, right, we bought a couch. You know, I, it, was, it was a big deal. I mean, that was a major growing pain. Yeah. Major. I mean, you know, we were we went through major growing pains to learn how to respond to that contract. That elevated us to a whole other level yeah. in terms of the business. And um, to this day, we still use a lot of those processes. Yeah. So it was huge, huge step forward, crazy. I love that story. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what about successful culture? What's been a proud moment or breakthrough you had with the CEO? You know, I um, my breakthrough moments, like I just facilitated a two-day strategic planning retreat with a client that I love, and they're um, merging with another company. So it was the first time during our two-day retreat that – the whole executive team of one company was in the room with the executive team of another company. And I'm the one who got them on the same page for mission, vision, values, SWOT analysis. It was the first time that they had all been together from like five different areas in the world. And um, the chemistry and the bonding, but more importantly, the action items, getting back to, you know, action items that came out of it. It was just, it was uh, extremely compelling and, transformational. I mean, it, you know, it was just, it was very, very impactful. So those two days were a really big deal for me. I mean, you mentioned was action items because a lot of times after those type of you know, functions, everyone feels good. But, yeah. Right. So what were some of those action items that they went and they, when, you know, Monday morning, they're hitting the pavement with these? Well, so I have a set of tools and we did a 30 day plan Oh, literally on the whiteboard for each person in that room. Hmm. I, we did a full 30-day plan. And then my tools that all of my clients use, I gave them those and they had to populate them with those with those action items. Mm -hmm. So I mapped out their whole 30 days for, um, for each person in that room. So they know everything for the next 30 days. They know everything they need to do to get they to the next to, level. Yeah. I've got one more person to do. Um, and that's dependent on something else, but yeah, that's super time consuming for you. How do you even do that with that many people and map out 30 it's days? Not that, it's not that consign, time consuming. Okay. It really isn't. It's about, you know, the larger activities. Um, but it really wasn't, I mean, it was, that was why we were there for two days. You know? Yes. So it was good. I mean, it was, it was definitely very rewarding and just, just seeing the, um, the transformation in my clients, like the, the confidence and migrating from reactive to proactive state and just, you know, I think for business, it's so important to feel like you're in the driver's seat to move your own agendas forward because you have a choice. You can either move your own agendas forward or you can move someone else's agenda forward. I mean, that's it. Like 
there's going to be progress. There's going to be movement. So are you moving yours forward or are you moving someone else's? Mm -hmm. And in order to move your own forward, you've got to be in the driver's seat. Yeah. So why call shotgun when you can drive, right? So that's really a lot of what I do with my my clients. How do you advise someone, like let's say they're new, not new, but maybe they're a few years and they don't want to turn away clients. And it sounds like you know, being in the driver's seat, you really need to turn away some clients who are not going to you know, kind of go with your agenda. What do you t- – go ahead. So you mean the low-hanging fruit? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it all starts with really clearly identifying who your target client is and what your value proposition is. And it takes a lot of discipline to do that. And we identify that. Before I work with anybody, they have to fill out a really detailed online assessment with the tool that I have. And like I said, that's what determines how we work together. And so part of my whole engagement up front is to really clarify who their target customer is Mm -hmm. and then evaluating that against what their current client base is and seeing who fits and who doesn't. A lot of what holds us back from getting rid of the clients that don't fit um, or um, or turning down the low hanging fruit is fear. And that gets back to what we talked about right from the very beginning is that fear can paralyze you, right? Well, what if I don't get anybody else? Well, how am I going to pay my mortgage? Right. And those are all legitimate questions, but you have to move forward in spite of the fear and in face of the, you know, in the face of the fear, if you're going to grow, you, you have to be able to say no to the good to say yes to the great. Yeah. So, Marissa, I appreciate your time. I have one last question, but I want you to just tell people, you know, where they can find you, what you're most excited about right now. Okay, so uh, you can find me at SuccessfulCulture.com, and I really would encourage everybody to opt into my blog there on leadership, entrepreneurship, and organizational culture. That's SuccessfulCulture.com. They can get my book on Amazon, um, Built to Scale. And um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter at Marissa Levin, Successful Culture. has a Facebook page. I'm just kind of all over the place. So connect with me there. And, uh, you know, if you're looking to move from current state to desired state, if you're looking to get to the next level, then please reach out to me and let's see how I can work with you. But my the thing that I'm most excited about is just being able to move people forward because I really believe that entrepreneurship is the backbone of our comp- of our country. And I'm all about creating a better entrepreneur. Yeah. So not to waste your time with it, who would be a good fit? Like what type of company? If they're a one person or 10 person, is there a certain typically, like real house for you? A million dollars. What but is it? I, at least a million dollars. Um, but you know what? I have companies that are much smaller and they are committed to growth. So it really is not so much of a dollar um, threshold as much of it is a mindset. Okay, so if you're really, you know, are you committed to doing what you need to do? Are you committed to being held accountable? Are you committed to looking at the processes and the people that you have around you? It really is a a mindset, Jeremy. It really isn't as much money as it is mindset. Yeah. Marissa, my last question for you is, I want to know what, you know, obviously you're always driving ahead with information experts, successful culture. You wrote two books. You have a lot going on. What <laughs> internally motivates you, inspires you, drives you to just keep striving and keep going with your vision? My kids. I mean, it, you know, that's it. My my legacy will not be that I've built these great companies or that I've written these books. Yeah. I have two sons. And my legacy is going to be that I've created, you know, two boys who treat women well, who respect women who want to be part of something bigger than themselves, who understand the importance of connection and community. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, I want to just always be able to look them in the eye um, and uh, from a place of integrity, you know? So my boys keep me honest. So what, um, obviously they're young. What do, what do they want to, what do they want to do right now? Well, yeah, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, right. What do they want to do? Like, uh, obviously, they see you and your husband. What do they want to do? It's kind of funny because, um, you know, people say it's entrepreneurship. You know, are you born with it or, you know, is it nurture versus nature? Right. My older son has no desire whatsoever to be an entrepreneur. He's like a rule follower, doesn't even like driving on the street if there's like no yellow lines. I mean, like <laughs> he is a rule follower, right? He is the most wicked negotiator you've ever met, like analytical, logical. And he either wants to be a senator 
or a lobbyist, um, and he's very into like national education reform. That's his main uh, his main pop you know issue of interest. Okay. So a senator or a lobbyist. So we'll see what happens there. Um, and my other son definitely has a little bit of an entrepreneurial streak, but right now he's very focused on being um, a sportscaster. Okay. So, football so we'll see where that goes so what does your oldest son negotiate you down from everything i mean it just you know it's all from a place of logic i mean it's just he just negotiate he just knows how to he knows how to make a very logical and compelling argument nice so but he, you know he's very trustworthy so it's okay it comes from a good place marissa i want to be the first one to thank you it's been an absolute pleasure thank it's you for great. taking the time no, it's been great. And I hope that, you know, someone out there got something of value from this and, um, you know, is able to move forward based on what they heard. For sure. Thanks okay. again. All right.